Many thanks for tuning in. You are watching the German episode of the Market Insights um, from the Book Fair 2020 from Frankfurt. Um, today we are talking about the German book market and all speakers work at the German Publishers and Booksellers Association. Um, the speakers today will be Thomas Koch, Head of Press and Public Relations, Jana Lippmann, Head of Market and Research, Nora Bechler working for Jana's team as a consultant for market research and Dr. Jessica Wenger, director at the, for the European International Affairs. My name is Anna Harley. I work as a PR manager and I have the great honor today to moderate this panel discussion. So Thomas, to get started, would you please first give us a short introduction into the German book market? Yeah, thank you, Anna. Um, I'm pleased to do that. Well, dear colleagues, I don't have to tell you, times are challenging for book markets all over the world, not only because of uh, COVID-19, but also before. Digitalization has changed the way people buy and um, read books. Book, um, books face the competition more and more of new forms of media, for example, streaming services that get more and more popular. And for example, bookstores have to cope with an increasing desolation of citizen centers, which means that less and less customers find their way into their stores. Nevertheless, we are glad that the German book market stays one of the largest and most vital of the world. With a constant turnover of roughly 9 billion euros each year, 2.5 million titles available on the market, and about 80,000 new editions every year, the German market tops the international comparison in terms of population size and turnover. Jana will go more into detail here later. In Germany, we have about 3,000 publishing houses that offer a broad range of books with a big variety of topics and authors. And we have a strong network of around 6,000 bookstores from big cities to small towns. So why is that? Books have a very important place in German society. Publishers and bookstores consider them not only not only salespeople, but contributors to an open, democratic and diverse society. And people and politicians in particular see that, so the book has a very high status in public perception. Germany is also still a country of readers, where reading is very popular amongst the big variety of other activities and media offers. Um, furthermore, publishers and bookstores not only ad adapted to the digital development, but they are helping to shape it. Almost every bookshop sells the books also online, and almost every new edition is published simultaneously as print and ebook. On the other hand, we have a very strong framework, a uh, political framework here in Germany. We have the fixed book prices, we have a strong copyright laws and also the reduced VAT. Jessica will talk about this issue uh, later. On this chart, you will find some more facts about bookshops and publishing houses. And in summary, I wanna say we are happy to have such a strong and vital book market here in Germany. Still, there are challenges. So that booksellers and publishers also are asked to keep up constantly with the development. I will come back to that at the end of this event. But thanks for now. Thanks, Thomas. I think that helped us to get a first feeling for our market. And I guess now we are ready to dive a little bit deeper. Jana, would you mind introducing us into the key figures? Yes, of course. Let's start by turning our attention first to one of the most well-known key figures when talking about a market the turnover. In 2019, the German book industry earned nearly 9.3 billion euro. This was an increase of 1.7% from 2018. Good news. You can also see good news when you look at the last 15 years. The turnover has been stable, more or less. 
and is now even higher than 15 years ago. This is a positive sign and was really not expected when you look at the stars below the line. During this time, a whole new industry appeared competing for the attention of the customers. So far, the new media have not caused a drop in turnover. But if we are looking at the number of book buyers, we see the digital revolution has not left the book market untouched. For years, we have been losing on average about 1 million book buyers per year, around 13% in the last five years. But at the same time, visible um, in the red box, um, the remaining buyers buy more books, on average 12.3 books per year, one more than five years ago. And the average price paid per book has been rising year after year. On the one hand, because publishers make some books more expensive, especially um, books written, written by uh, well-known writers. On the other hand, because buyers, are books, uh, buyers of books are not very price sensitive in general. Let me summarize what this means. We are losing book buyers, but the remaining buyers buy more books and pay on average more per book. This leads to, um, to stable turnover. But we know it will not work in long time to compensate the lost buyers with purchases of the remaining buyers. So two years ago, we started to shine a spotlight on lost buyers with a big study called Book Buyers Quo Vadis. Um, to see what is wrong with these people. You can find the conclusion also in English on our website. One of the many findings of this research, people lost orientation in the book market. Reasons for this are, in a nutshell, people spend a lot of time with social media and Netflix and, Netflix and so on. And so um, some people talk no, no longer so much about books. This is the reason why people miss personal recommendations. They are less involved in the subjects of book market, don't know new releases, and the awareness of writers decreases. This leads to stress finding the perfect book to read next. People have no patience and um, no time to spend in shops looking for the next book. This is one of the reasons they don't buy. The book sector has been working on a solution for missing orientation for two years and um, and Thomas will come back to this point later. First, um, some more key figures. Now, we see the share of turnover by uh, different sales channels. Retail bookshops, also called brick and mortar shops, are the most important sales channels for the German book market. This channel generates nearly half of the turnover with a share of nearly of more than 46% and an increasing turnover last year. The second biggest share are publishers with their diet business. Publishers direct sales are mostly sales to companies and institutions. So this is um, most of all a business channel for scientific and uh, specialized books. But also general trade publishers earn uh, some turnover on this way. Sales by online book trade rose by 1.5% by 1 in 2019. So the online trade secured a 20% share of the industry's total turnover. Much of this from Amazon, but not at all. But not all. The figures also include online revenues from the retail bookshops, which are enjoying an increasing demand on the web. <coughs> Meanwhile, almost all retailers have online shops, also the small independent bookshops. <clears throat> the sales also flow into the rising internet turnover. Uh, we estimate um, Amazon's share of internet book trade only at around 50%. You can also see on this picture during the last years, the strong increase on internet book selling at the expense of offline book trade has absolutely slowed down. And so 
The times when brick and mortar booksellers were afraid of internet book trade are definitely over. They know also how to use the benefits of e-commerce. Now, I want to focus your attention on genres. Fiction is the most important category for the German market, with 30.9% share of turnover. The second most important source, uh, source of turnover is always the category children's and young adults, with a share of 70%. Turnover in this category has been growing for years and will continue to do so. The Corona year 2020, in the Corona year 2020, also Nora will show later, as Nora will show later. Sales of non-fiction books have also been booming for several years, and Nora will say something about the most selling books in this category. Beforehand, let's take a look at some more key figures. Here, the production of titles by German book publishers. As in sales, fiction books and books for children and young adults are the most important categories. More than 17,000 17, new titles appear every year, of which more than 20% are fiction and more than 10% are books for children and young adults. Title production has been declining for years. Publishers seem to focus their activities and a big number of titles is a challenge for booksellers and also for customers' orientation. So, a declining number of titles is not really bad news. However, the number of translations remains stable. Nearly 10,000 new titles are translated into German every year. So nearly 14% of all first editions came from other languages. English is, English is the most important langu language of origin of trans to English is the most important language of origin for translations into German, sorry. Books from English-speaking countries accounted for around 61% of all translations, followed by French and Japanese. The most translations from, from Japanese are comics, especially mangas. In the book market, licenses are something, are something like the counterpart of translations. As we have seen, about 9,800 books came from other languages to the German book market and about 7,800 7, works made in Germany cross the border. The leading partner is China with nearly an 18% share. The most selling licenses to China are children's books, especially picture books. Books for children and young readers are also the most important category for the whole licensing business. The second place belongs to fiction, followed by science and self-help books. These have been the key figures for the year 2019 and um, the earlier years. But Nora, could you please introduce us into the figures that shows the impact of the corona pandemic on the German market? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, of course, the corona measures, particularly store closures and the cancellation of events, have hit the publishers and bookstores hard in Germany. But um, the bookstores reacted really quickly to the new situation and set up delivery services. And as uh, my colleagues have already noted, um, lots of them already had online shops, which helped a lot in this situation. And also the publishers reacted quickly by organizing digital events like readings and discussions. Um, we also have to say that um, we got a lot of support from our government, especially like financial aids and also bookshops were allowed to reopen relatively early. Um, in Germany, the stores closed in the middle of March, on March 18th, um, and remained closed for about five weeks. 
there are differences though between the federal states. So uh, for example, in Berlin and Saxony-Anhalt, bookstores did not close. Um, there was a minus of 65.7% during the time the stores were closed. Um, not all product groups were affected by that in the same way. They were all affected heavily, but mostly the travel books were lost a lot of um, turnover in this time um, because, of course, traveling was there were so many restrictions on traveling that travel books were not um, there was no demand, almost no demand for travel books anymore. Um, if you look at all sales channels, um, the minus is not as big, it's minus 46.0% for this same time frame. Um, that shows that um, the sales channels couldn't compensate, the other sales channels couldn't compensate for the closed bricks and mortar bookstores completely. Um, also an interesting fact that uh, is um, worth noting is that the day with the highest turnover from March until May was March 17th. So the day before the stores had to close, a lot of people bought books again. Then after reopening, we see here the turnover de development after that. So in on the left hand side is the retail book bookstores um, starting with a minus of 21.1% at um, on, yeah, roughly middle of April when the stores were allowed to open again and have now by the end of August um, reduced that minus to 10.8%. And we don't have the final numbers for September yet, but um, it seems that we are now in the single digits for the retail bookstores. The sales channel started off with a minus of 14.9%. And have by the end of August also narrowed the gap quite significantly to 5.8%. To go a little more into detail on that, we see again the development until August, but also the development of the product groups. And I think it's worth noting here that uh, books for children and young adults actually noted above the um, results for the same period in the last year, there's actually a plus of 5.0%. And I think that shows quite uh, clearly what, an, what a great importance books have for children. Um, because especially in this time of crisis, when schools, etc., were closed, um, they provided an activity, an education, and a feeling of stability for the children. Then um, another interesting fact that we found is um, the best-selling books during the store closures, because as I already said, um, children's books, there was a particularly high demand for children's books, and it's also reflected here, because among the 15 best-selling titles, um, this is regardless of category and format and by sales volume. Um, there are several books for children. And also um, worth noting that um, obviously many people uh, in this time had an interest in, in reading The Plague by Camus, which uh, reappeared in the bestsellers list. Uh, in comparison, here is the best-selling books in 2019. Um, as I already said, or as I already sort of, uh, yeah, noted, um, there's only one children's book in here, like on, on 10, um, it's, and, um, far, so it's far less children's book than it was in, in the time doing the store closures. Um, and also as I found also kind of interesting is that, um, there are also a lot of, um, or significantly more, I think, non-fiction titles and companion books in this list than in the list before. So people obviously read fiction and they also read um, children's books or bought children's books for their kids. Um, I now would like to look at the ebook development um, in Germany. The percentage of turnover of ebooks is 
not really that high. It's about 5%. It was 5% in 2019 and also in the year before that. Um, we now have numbers for the first half of 2020. Um, where there was a growth in turnover of 17.8%. And if you look at the numbers more closely, you can see that all this um, increase actually stems from the first, um, from sorry, from the second quarter of the year. Um, it's kind of interesting to see that the number of ebook buyers didn't rise significantly in this uh, time period. It's actually the average purchase intensity that um, makes the difference here combined with slightly higher prices as well. But um, people bought significantly more, but it's not the fact that a lot of people who didn't buy ebooks before suddenly started buying ebooks. So now it's uh, I want to focus as well on the publishing houses for a little bit. Um, we did a we conducted a survey among, among our members in early June um, just to find out what the situation of the publishing houses in the Corona crisis looks like. Um, and what we see here is a projection based on our results for all publishing houses. Um, and by that, the turnover of the publishing houses fell by almost a third during the store closures and also by the end of May. Um, there was still a significant minus, so they had suffered a cumulative decline and turnover of around 15% in that time period compared to the year before. And um, the effects of the corona crisis, on the one hand, of course, it had an effect on program planning. Um, it impacted almost three quarters of the publishing houses in our survey. And the most common reaction was that they postponed titles to, to next year. About half of the publishers actually planned to do that when we asked them. And some titles that they planned for this year will not be published at all is also something that was mentioned quite frequently, actually, by just under 36% of those in our survey, mm, which, of course, is a problem in regards to the diversity of the book market. The corona crisis, as you all know, also led to the cancellation of a huge number of events um, like congresses and conferences. Um, less than 10% of the publishing houses in our survey said that there was no effect on the event planning. Um, but well over 60% had to cancel like congresses and conferences and the placement of book tables and readings. Um, and all these events account for a significant share of the publisher's total turnover, um, particularly um, the placement of book tables, um, which generate around 10% of the turnover. Um, and even for um, small publishing houses, it's even up to 15 or 17 percent, so they were even more affected by this. So, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. I suppose the picture of the German book market will become clearer and clearer to everyone watching. Um, but what we have not yet discussed is the legal framework here in Germany. Jessica, you can certainly help us here. Um, as many of you may know, we are a fixed book price country, meaning that there's a law in place that regulates retail prices for books. The, I've put on the slide here for you the scope uh, which books are covered. So this covers essentially German language books um, and ebooks and products potentially in other languages that are directed at the German market. It does also cover cross-border sales into the German market so that circumvention can be avoided. Uh, what it doesn't actually touch is temporary access, so access to databases where you may find book content but not actually full individual books um, um, for download or access. 
So how does this work? Uh, essentially, it's the publisher's job to decide on a retail price for each title. Um, that price may vary, of course, depending on the edition the title is sold in. So a hardback or a paperback will potentially have different prices, as in any market, I think. Um, the uh, price may be cancelled after 18 months, but that's not usually the default situation. What usually happens is that books remain within the fixed price for the duration uh, of their life in the market. Regarding the relationship within the value chain, of course, um, discounts are negotiated. So the publisher will negotiate with the wholesaler um, or the retailer um, for the discount that they receive from the retail price. And there are certain limits in place um, regulating these discounts, which will um, which, which aim to support the the basic uh, goals of this law, which is uh, which are to sustain a diverse um, retail landscape, you could say, and um, a great a large diversity in titles. Um, I won't go into detail on certain uh, reductions on the retail price, but there are certain cases all governed by the statute, so all mandatory, more or less, um, within which um, certain discounts can be made. Um, so why do we do this? What's the point, essentially, um, for us? The fixed book price, we think, has a very positive effect on the market in the sense that publishers um, are able to cross-subsidize titles that are perhaps less will generate perhaps less, fewer sales, but they can cross subsidize those from bestsellers. That's simply because what we see in many um, non fixed book price markets is that bestsellers tend to be sold at very low prices, sometimes in supermarkets and in other outlets um, where retailers are not really making a selection of particular titles they want to present to readers but are just essentially selling books like any other product and that is something that of course doesn't happen in the fixed book price um, world because the price um, will always be the same so there's more certainty if there's a bestseller that actually publishers and booksellers um, will be able to get uh, more revenue out of that than perhaps in other situations. This makes smaller print runs sustainable. It also means publishers can invest more in niche titles, debuts perhaps. And what we also see is that prices for the more niche titles or specialist books tend to be lower than in free price markets. I think the diversity in titles that uh, we um, are able to present to readers in Germany is represented to some extent by the two and a half million titles that are available in the books in print database. As I mentioned um, earlier on, there is a certain uh, regulation of the uh, margins within the fixed book price law um, between publishers and wholesalers, for instance, from which wholesalers benefit, again, in order to be able to sustain a, quite a sophisticated logistics system, um, meaning that ordinarily any customer who orders a book from their local bookshop before five o'clock in the afternoon are usually able to pick it up when the shop opens in the morning, and that uh, is sustained to some extent by the fixed book price rules. Uh, booksellers, of course, are not in the position of having to fight a price war. I mentioned the uh, margins that they can more or less count on from certain best-selling titles. And again, I think diversity and, and a broad choice for readers are what the law aims for and to some extent is indeed able to secure. Uh, one of the other important factors in the framework um, is well known, I think, to many, certainly in Europe, um, the reduced VAT rate that applies to books. The standard rate in Germany is normally 19% and books are sold at 17, 7%. 
Um, at the moment, due to COVID-19, we're in a situation where the government has, as one of its relief measures uh, for the economy, lowered VAT to 16%, that's the full rate, and 5% as the reduced rate. So at the moment, it's actually 5% until the end of the year. I have to say, though, that in a fixed book price uh, scenario, this has been not entirely helpful. It's, it's actually made things quite complicated because obviously booksellers can't simply discount titles because they're still bound by the fixed price. This is a little bit complicated and one of the reasons that this specific element of COVID-19 relief isn't helping us much. But uh, just to keep you in the picture, until the end of the year, we're at 5% for books instead of 7 the uh, reduced rates apply more or less to the same product as the fixed price. It's not a complete um, overlap, but essentially books and now also ebooks. That's something we fought quite a long time to achieve. Uh, European law had to be adjusted in order to make that possible. And since December 2019, in Germany, ebooks also benefit from the lower. VAT rate, which is particularly helpful in contexts where, for instance, you have a physical book sold with perhaps an access code in it to a digital service representing extra content that comes with a book or perhaps an ebook version of the same title. We used to have huge trouble um, distinguishing between the VAT rates there, and that's improved a lot. So that makes a difference. Uh, looking at the copyright framework in Germany, I think as in general terms, I describe it as a droit d'auteur based system. So a system that um, places heavy emphasis on the moral rights of the author. Uh, in that sense, it's closer to French law than to the Anglo-Saxon legal traditions. Uh, the system of exceptions of copyright is based not on fair use, like for instance in the US, but on a system that you could describe as fair dealing, where we have specific exceptions enumerated in the law that describe precisely um, when they can be relied upon and how much they permit, how much use without permission by uh, the rights holder they permit. Enforcement of copyright law in Germany is based on statute and the European framework, but it is also significantly, um, has been quite significantly developed in case law, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And another um, particular uh, feature of German copyright law is that there are quite a few rules governing the contract with the author. So copyright contract law and the remuneration to authors, illustrators, translators is um, quite heavily governed by law. Speaking of the challenges we face here, I think one of our main challenges at the moment is that the exception system was reformed in 2018 and exceptions for um, education, research and libraries were quite significantly broadened. I've put on the slides here for you what precisely that means. Um, so quite large portions of works may be used for these specific purposes of illustration for teaching, for instance, or for research in a way that we think um, is definitely too extensive and um, really quite um, noticeably or potentially severely even impacts um, the primary market. So that's a concern, certainly, um, especially because there is no um, individual compensation for each use under these exceptions. There's only a lump sum compensation for the harm caused by the exceptions via um, CMOs, so collective management organizations. And um, the initially when this um, broadening of the exceptions was put through, it was justified to some extent by the fact that it was going to apply only for a few years. Uh, so there was a sunset clause in the law. And this year we've seen the draft law that aims to abolish that sun or to scrap that sunset clause and um, allow these exceptions to apply indefinitely 
we're still trying to resist that, but that's quite a serious challenge, I think, for our sector. Another very specific German problem, if I may say, is um, that in the collective management system, which has quite an important role um, in Germany where um, reprography, where uh, private uses are remunerated through collective management organizations, the publisher's share in those payments or those revenues from collective management um, has not been in place since 2015. There was a court case um, that ended up going to the Supreme Court and where the pre-existing system of um, publisher share was abolished on the basis of European, of a specific interpretation, I should say, of European law, uh, upon which we were able um, to work with other stakeholders to get the European framework clarified. That came through with the copyright directive in 2019. So we now have a secure basis in European law for the publisher share, but uh, we're still working to get the repair work done and go back to a viable system of publisher share at national level that still needs to be implemented. So finally, um, I mentioned earlier copyright enforcement. I would say that German courts have a pretty good record of trying to hold um, those platforms to account that are major infringers um, and who systematically and probably deliberately um, build their model on copyright infringement. So one of the important cases in this context is a ruling on the rapid share platform, which was a cyber locker. And the court developed something um, that we would, I think, best describe as an application of the tort of nuisance. So a civil law remedy where an actor in the market um, you could say disturbs the order and, and the direct translation of the German term Störer is sort of disturber. I've put it on the slide here as instigator because I think that's, first of all, it's a real word in English, but it's also um, contains the element that I think is important where there's a, a degree of encouragement of the copyright infringement by that platform. So if a service is causal for a copyright infringement, so the actions of this platform. And if that service um, receives notice, so has actual knowledge of that infringement, and they didn't um, take reasonable measures to prevent similar future infringements, there's liability. So this is a system where to a certain and limited extent, um, platforms will have to ensure stay down essentially of um, works that have been notified. This is obviously not a comprehensive solution to the problem we all know with notice and takedown, but cyber lockers are obliged to check their link resources, register users and for rapid share, that meant that it actually ceased its major infringing operations. Um, because this isn't, um, yet an established, well, real solution. There are still um, cases ongoing in the courts. And one of them that involves, among others, YouTube has gone to the European Court of Justice and it still not hasn't been decided, but the advocate general's opinion that we've seen hasn't been particularly promising on um, closing another gap in enforcement there, but we're waiting, we're waiting to see what the court does with it and how this goes. So those challenges are still out there. Um, well, and I can say, I suppose it's never boring. We, we need to um, keep working on those challenges, though I think in Germany we can say we do have a relatively sound legal framework still um, for the book sector. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks a lot. Um, we have now examined the German book market from a variety of perspectives. 
Um, however, as my colleagues have mentioned before, the Corona pandemic has thrown our market, like many others, um, quite out of balance. So having this in mind, um, how would you describe the possibilities and threats for the upcoming chapters, Thomas? Yeah, thanks a lot to my colleagues who I think were able to show you um, yeah, how the German book market works, then that it's a strong and vital book market. But at the end of this, um, sorry, at the end of this event, I want to draw your attention for a short moment to the main challenges that is facing the industry, um, but also the opportunities. So, uh, as you can imagine, the main task is now to close the sales gap uh, in this current year because bookstores and publishers are still uh, behind due to the massive decline in sales during lockdown. The last quarter of this year will be very um, decisive here because Christmas sales are very important. Uh, we are optimistic that we can close a big part of the gap if there are no more unexpected development, developments now. Um, but still, there is the uncertainty, especially for uh, publishers, how the developments with COVID-19 will be. For example, will there be events in the, in the near future? Will there be expositions? So this is quite uh, an uncertainty that will stay. Um, then, as we saw that the number of book buyers is uh, declining, it will be very important to continue and intensify the work on new ways to reach readers um, now at this moment. Um, and for example, we are about to um, develop a new guidance system based on the subconscious reading motives as a supplement to the classifications that are already existing. For example, the product product groups um, like literature, nonfiction, and also the classification thema, the international classification. So this will be quite interesting how this how this will work, and we hope that it helps um, the readers to find the way to the book that they want to read, the right book. And um, yeah, this is one thing. There are a lot of opportunities, though. Um, we saw that um, bookshops reacted really quickly to, to the lockdown and they had the opportunity to show um, their, their online skills. So now more and more people um, know that their bookshop around the corner has also an online shop and that they don't have to buy necessarily their books at Amazon. So this high level of visibility for, for these online skills that offers the industry um, is quite an opportunity that we got out of the crisis. Um, and then bookshops also were able to strengthen the, their customer loyalty. Um, lots of customers uh, bought their books online at their bookstore or they, they, there was the delivery that they used. So book shows book sh bookstores have proven really that they are a reliable supplier of books during the crisis um still it's very important to also work on the frameworks the good frameworks that we have to keep them and also to strengthen them it will be important to make more and more visible the important role of that books and the industry um, have during and can also have after the pandemic and on the way out of the pandemic. This is like we have to do there a lot of work, a lot of public relations and lobbying work. Um, what, which is also, what is also important is uh, that bookshops and publishers, they need still need economic uh, support for the, the restart out of the crisis now. Um, for example, there is a program by the German state, it's called Restart Culture, where um, bookshops and publishers can get financial support for new projects that they, that they want to in place. Um, and one thing which is also very important is um, that we need more visibility for books uh, in the public because, for example, TV stations and radio stations, a lot of 
programs uh, around books have vanished there in the last years. And um, it is very important now to, to, yeah, to talk to the stations and to, to get really more visibility for books, that people hear more about books, that they talk more about books. Um, also events like Frankfurt Book Fair, for example. So to conclude, as I started, um, times are challenging, but publishers and booksellers in Germany are really self-confident uh, and, and optimistic. They have a lot to offer to society. They contribute to a high quality and diverse cultural life, um, to freedom and also to democracy. And they are committed to shape digitalization th themselves while also not forgetting their traditions. So it's challenging, but also good times ahead on the book market. And I would, yeah, would say, <laughs> let's tackle it. Thank you very much for your attention. I would say that this is an encouraging conclusion. Um, we hope that you can take away some interesting insights from this episode. Um, thanks a lot for watching and have a fabulous time at further events um, at the Book Fair Special Edition. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.